Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. Next up on the show, Mark Mothersbaugh. Mark Mothersbaugh doesn't need that much introduction. He's a composer who's worked in TV and film for almost four decades. That includes classics like Pee Wee's Playhouse, Rushmore, and Taika Waititi's Thor Ragnarok. Mother's Spa also co-founded and fronts Devo, who are Devo, the beloved new wave post-punk band. And guess what? Devo's back. They're touring the U.S. with a handful of dates, still as fun as ever, so we figured we'd reach out to Mark Mothersbaugh for a segment we call the craziest day of my entire career. And wow, when we asked Mark Mothersbaugh for such a day, he delivered. This story has it all. Celebrities, discos, wild miscommunications. There's also some drug use and descriptions of violence in this segment, too. So we wanted to give you a heads up about that. Anyway, let's do this. Mark Mothersbaugh on the craziest day of his entire career. All right. um, Months, I'm not going to get exact on this story, but I can tell you year, it was 1977, Devo had gone to Germany to record an album with Brian Eno and David Bowie. And then uh, when we finished, we were flying back to the U.S. and um, Jerry and I stopped in uh, New York before going back to Ohio, where we lived. The day I get into the into my hotel, a woman who was an AR person from Columbia called me up and said, hi, I'm Susan Bloom. What are you doing tonight? And I go, well, I have no plans. And she said, would you like to go on a double date with me? And I go, sure. She goes, well, we're going out with Andy Warhol and Michael Jackson. I said, okay, sounds good to me. Where are we going? And she goes, Studio 54. I'd heard of Studio 54. I didn't know much about it. I knew it was about disco, which I was critical of at the time and a little bit jealous at the same time. Disco was antithetical to Devo because it was apolitical, non-political and the thing that I that I was jealous about was that there was a lot of good sounds in in disco music so going to Studio 54 I was kind of like well I have no idea what I'm in for but I'm going to be in good company so I, I went and looked through my suitcase and I had Dickie's janitorial outfits which I wore every day I just went to Sears Roebuck and I used to buy like gray shirts and gray pants so that I kind of looked like I could have been the high school janitor, you know, custodian, because that's, that's the look I was going for. You know, so I put that on, and then she, it came time, and uh, she came over to my hotel room, and she goes, I'm wearing this silly dress from work. What do you have in your suitcase I could wear? And I'm like, what? You don't want to wear any of my clothes. It's, you know, I don't have... And so she went through my, cl- my suitcase that I'd just come back from England with and found a pair of blue jeans. And so she said, ah, these are great. So she put on my blue jeans and a T-shirt. And uh, we went out the door, and we went to Studio 54, and we got ushered in some VIP thing while people in a long line are craning their necks to see who it is. And nobody knew who I was, you know. So I'm like, I'm like waving, and people are like, who's that? Is, you know, is that, you know. And we go in, and we get taken over to a special roped-off seating area. Definitely, we were in the VIP area, and it was like a sunken living room. And we're sitting there with Andy at Warhol. We get introduced to Andy, he goes, oh, hi. And uh, Michael's very quiet, and he had just finished doing The Wiz. So he was dressed in all like 
patchwork suede, and he had a big Apple hat on. So we all sat down, and then of course, because it's Andy Warhol and Michael, people are trying to reach over the curtain, you know, thing, and I'm turning around saying hi, and, and those guys are ignoring them, and, and I'm like, wow, where am I, this place? Is, and I felt totally out of place. Nobody knows who the hell I am or why I'm there. As far as they know, I'm like a, a valet, or I'm dressed like a TV repairman, so maybe I'm fixing one of their TVs. And um, they're chatting with everybody, and s somehow I see a joint get passed around. And, you know, it goes to a few people, and then it gets over to Michael, and he just, like, waves it off. He doesn't want it, and it comes to me. And so I thought, well, you know, we don't have marijuana in Ohio. You know, it's 1977, and I didn't have money if we would have had it. So I thought, better try it. So I take a big hit of this joint and start coughing, and nobody's paying attention to me anyhow. So I pass the joint over to Susan, who's next to me, and she's like, waves me off, like, no, 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 I'm, you know, she's leaning into a conversation with somebody. She's having this, this heavy, important conversation about nothing. And so I go, well, Okay, so I, I, I still have the joint, so I take another hit, and I figure I might as well take a big one while I'm at it, you know, and so I'm taking a hit off this joint, and I, you know, at that, I'm like, okay, I, I smoke most of this thing, so I should just, so I pass it somewhere, I don't know where it goes, you know, somebody gets it. Not long after that, Susan goes, hey, you wanna dance? And I'm like, I go, well, I, I really don't know how to dance. And she's like frustrated that I'm not gonna dance. And so she brings her girlfriend with her. And the three of us go out and she just has me stand there next to this big filled dance floor. But I'm looking at my outfit and I'm feeling even more like, well, I really don't belong here. I, I don't look the part. I'd look totally wrong for this place. Cause he's, you know, cause these guys have like these big fat stacked shoes and they got, you know, like, like Rod Stewart haircuts and they're like flapping their arms like birds while they dance like they're doing like these flamingo dances and everybody knows what to do and they're all doing the right thing and I'm like man I wouldn't even know how I don't even know how to do that I would just laugh at myself if I saw myself in the mirror making those moves I couldn't do it I would I just stayed off off the dance floor and you know, the songs are playing and it's all the songs you know from the world of disco from those days and all the hits are playing. And it was kind of interesting because they didn't have a lot of fancy lights back in those days. But you know, Studio 54 was on the cutting edge and they had these things. They had these lights that went up into the ceiling and it was like outdoor um, colored light fixtures. It's not really, you know, they, there's no LEDs in those days yet. There's nothing like that. There's no tech stuff. They, they had like a strobe light, you know, that they were showing some of the time. So there's a strobe light. And then there were these things that were three-sided, like uh, six foot tall, very angular sided um, light pictures that they had this thing where they could lower them down to right above the heads of everybody that's dancing so that the lights would slowly turn and those three sides of colored lights would be like making the room full of color that was like washing. It was like crazy disco time. It was like, that was like really, that was what disco really was. And there's a DJ and a lighting guy and they're in this booth, you know, and there's Donna Summer song or something playing. And I'm watching and they've like, it's a really intense song, whatever it is. And they've turned the revolving lights. They're bringing them down again to right over top of the crowd you know that's dancing and the place is packed with people dancing I can't even see Susan because she's kind of like about 15 feet away from me out in the middle of the dance floor you know and so I'm watching though this thing happened this guy turns these light fixtures really fast and the song gets really intense whatever song it is they're like blasting the, the volume you know and uh, these fixtures they start going faster and faster these lighting fixtures and they're like picking up speed, and they're picking up speed, and they're not like just twirling, you know, like twirling on their axis. They're like now, they're like swirling, more like a weed whacker, and they keep coming down closer to the audience, and I watch them come down far enough. This guy must be out of his mind over there in the lighting booth. He brings them down so close, they start hitting people in the head. The lighting fixtures are flying really fast, and they're hitting people in the head, and 
I see blood spurt out of this guy's head and he drops to his knees and then, but then he's covered up by other dancers. You can't see him. And then I see it happen to a girl and she screams out, but you can't even hear her because the music's so loud. And Susan Bloom's out there dancing and, and she looks at me and she goes, she puts her hand out and, and you know, makes her fingers in this motion like, come on, come on. And she's doing this, this, you know, this disco move, you know, with her, with her shoulders and her, and her hips. And, and I'm like, oh, what the hell? I go, look at that. And she's like, come on. And I'm looking at more people are getting hit and there's screaming happening all over the room. This thing is out of control. All these people have gotten hit by these, these lighting fixtures. And she looks at me and she comes over and she goes, what is it? I go, did you see what happened to those people just now? Did you see what those lighting fixtures? They're hitting people in the head. And she's like, what? And she looks over and then I look over too. And they're just hanging there normal. They're just hanging there and they're just slowly twirling in a circle above everybody's head, two or three feet above people's heads. She looks at me in the eyes and my eyes probably look crazy. And she goes, you didn't smoke any of that PCP, did you? And I go, what's PCP? And so she takes me by the arm and we go back over to where Andy is. And he's like, hey, what's going on? And she goes, Andy, he just smoked a lot of PCP and I better get him out of here now. She takes me out to a cab and we get in it and she takes me back to, I think it was Helmsley, Hotel, Holmesley Estate, something like that. It was like um, the hotel I was staying at at the time. And she gets me up to my room, gets behind me and pushes me into the room onto my bed. She goes, good luck. I'll give you your pants back tomorrow. And then just pulls the door shut. And I just remember I sat there and I was hallucinating and going, what just happened? What just happened? For like uh, the next four or five hours before I finally passed out. <sighs> so that was my one and only visit to Studio 54. I became the, the guy in Devo that had absolutely no interest in drugs. I didn't want to have anything to do with drugs, to be honest with you, for until I found out about a leave saved me from a back problem I was having. Mark Mothersbaugh, on the craziest day of his entire career, the time he lost his mind at Studio 54 in the company of Andy Warhol and Michael Jackson. Devo, as we said, are back touring. They have a handful of dates set for this year and next. Mark is still scoring movies and TV shows. You can hear his music in the upcoming movie Hotel Transylvania Transformania, which also stars former Bullseye guests Catherine Hahn and Steve Buscemi. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is created in the homes of me and the staff of Maximum Fun in and around greater Los Angeles, California. We're here at my house. I have to time all of my recordings around the, uh, <laughs> the regular passing of the ice cream truck. Um, and unfortunately, it's not because I'm running outside to get ice cream. It's that the song it plays is super loud. Our show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our senior producer is Kevin Ferguson. Our producer is Jesus Ambrosio. I used to be a bomb pop guy, but they have its-its at this uh, ice cream truck. So when I do run out, I, I usually end up dropping the dough on an its-it. Anyway, production fellows at Maximum Fun are Richard Roby and Valerie Moffat. We get help from Casey O'Brien. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. The other day I went to a movie about Burt Reynolds with Dan Wally. He told me about a record come up in San Diego. Good guy, Dan Wally. Our theme song is by The Go Team. Thanks to them and their label Memphis Industries for sharing it with us. You can keep up with our show on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. We post all our interviews there. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.